So yeah, I put a mini fridge in the O11 Mini and yeah, my core temps are reading zero degrees, but is the solution to too much power more power? Welcome to Machines and More. I have to admit, I chuckled a little when I saw this one. It's no secret that Intel's stuck on 14 nanometer, and this is sort of one way to deal with it, I guess. And I know it sounds funny, but that's exactly what this is. A little fridge for your unlocked Intel CPU. This product, the ML360 Sub-Zero, is a collaborative effort between Intel and Cooler Master for 10th generation Intel Comet Lake S chips. And while I can t definitively tell you it can live up to its claim of being sub-zero, sort of, that's a very limited use case. Big thanks to Cooler Master today for sending by the test unit, and I'll talk through some of my testing and impressions in earnest. Regular AAOs and liquid coolers are subject to the limitations from the ambient room temperature the system is running in, and while in practice, it's very rare for the liquid temp to equal the ambient temp that is the theoretical lower limit. If you're really into overclocking, you usually go LN2, and if you have a lot of money to blow, liquid helium, but you're not going to be running that on a regular basis for a gaming or even a workstation. As a sort of go-between solution, the cooler uses a thermoelectric or Peltier heat pump to create a cold side which contacts the CPU's IHS to help cool it down even more. Now, Peltier devices consume power, and in fact, they're quite inefficient for cooling, but are relatively compact and can fit into a PC-build-sized component. The intent is to allow users more ability for low core count overclocking. This AIO features a 360mm radiator with three high-performance SF120R Cooler Master fans, and although th these fans aren't something you can just buy separately, they look a lot like the SF120M fans from Cooler Master, just with less decoration. This is a separate pump unit with mounting hardware and the CPU block, and here's the integrated thermoelectric cooler. It's a big, heavy block. On the bottom of this, there is a large rubber shroud to prevent condensation from building up on the neighboring components. To mount it up, it uses a simple back plate and stand offset thread into the back plate and the head unit screws onto the standoffs. This pump block is meant to attach to a fan slot, so I went ahead and just mounted it to the side bracket on the O11 Mini. Thermal paste is pre-applied to the cold plate and the unit needs power from an 8-pin PCIe cable, just like what your GPU would use. And if that foreshadows just how much power, don't be surprised. Uh, USB 2.0 cable will also need connecting back to the motherboard. The fans and the pump will all be connected back to a SATA power connection. Now I tried to mount it up first with the Gigabyte Z490 ITX Aorus board that I had in this case before, but there was interference on the rubber shroud with some of the uh, motherboard components. So I went ahead and just switched out the board to the ATX Aorus Elite, something I was gonna do anyway for this build. Though this board isn't listed as supported for the cooler, it does work just fine. And even the latest BIOS update for the board mentions support for Intel cryo overclocking. And if you want to mount a 360 millimeter rad with this uh, case and an ATX port, it will not fit on the rails, but it actually can be made to work with just some zip ties that you can actually conceal quite nicely. There is potential interference if you have tall or oddly shaped RAM, but at least with my component kit with a ballistics RAM, there wasn't any issue. Um, there is also a height limitation about 45 millimeters with the way these tubes are running with this AIO. I tested this out with an i9-10850K and using Intel's XTU software, I played around with single core overclocking and also did that in BIOS too. Now based on Cooler Master, this unit has an advantage for low core overclocking where the advantage would really play out more for the fun of running performance benchmarks. After installing the drivers and the Intel cryo overclocking or cryo cooling software, you get a little icon in your system tray for the cryo cooler. Uh, typically, it'll default to standby mode until you choose either cryo or unregulated. Users will probably stick with cryo since the system at, with that setting manages the level of cooling based on the surrounding air temperature 
in order to avoid excessive condensation and damage to your sensitive PC components. To test, I just made use of Cinebench R23 first and did a baseline run at 4.8 GHz, score is 1323, which is pretty typical for stock turbo performance on the 10850K. Now, being a lower bin 10900K, it can typically be pushed to 5.2 GHz on single core turbo, but with the cryo cooling enabled, I was able to get up to 5.3, and it's not a huge improvement. Um, the, that did push things up to about 1400 on Cinebench R23. Now, that being said, this CPU stayed exceedingly cool at about 40 degrees the entire time. And when running the same bench with a cryo cooler on standby, it crashed. So if you have great silicon, it's definitely possible to go higher. If you don't, just enjoy the lower temps. I also attempted to go all core on 5.1 gigahertz and 1.25 volts. And while it did run, it wasn't pretty. The chip still managed to hit very close to thermal throttle, about 97 degrees. Now, Cooler Masters literature suggests that for all core OCs, the cooler achieves parity with a similar AIO. Now, that didn't make any sense to me initially since you have a fridge in there, shouldn't it be cooling the chip better than a regular AIO? But after running the unit and observing how it works, it makes total sense. For low core count overclocks, the system operates at a low power, and for a single core test, it was only running at extra 20 watts or so. For heavy loads, the thermal electric cooler can draw up to 200 watts, and when I looked at the power usage during the all-core OC, it was indeed going up to about 180 watts. So that's the reason for that PCIe power cable, right? So with all that heat that's added back in the system, because it all runs off that same radiator, it's more or less the same as just using a regular AIO. Uh, when you set the cooler to unregulated, it no longer operates conservatively based on the ambient air temp, and it just flat out cools your chip to as cold as it can get. And when I did that, I saw idle temps of zero degrees. Fascinating, right? At that point, you would have to worry about condensation since that level of cooling is bringing the surface of that cooler well past the dew point of most room temps. Qualitatively, this unit is really intriguing, although it definitely gave the impression typical of a first generation product. This pump is ridiculously loud, running at 5500 RPM, and no, there's no way I could put up with this the entire time. Uh, my wife heard the commotion from the room nearby and asked me how I could stand all that noise, and I just laughed and said, no, I can't take it either. I couldn't find a way to dial it down either. Um, in other words, this is a full blast unit for overclocking fun, and really that's where the fun ends. Uh, the installation is not terribly complex, but there's a lot of cables and complexity to add to your system. You have to have a huge power supply to run the thing, the right motherboard, and this thing doesn't even start to make sense unless you're already running something like a 10850K or a 10900K. So to me, it's a super niche product with a very limited use case. And I can only see this being for the overclocking enthusiast who just wants something that can be used on a more regular basis compared to LN2. Uh, for someone who's interested in all core overclocking for gaming or productivity usage, and you really, really, really want to run an Intel CPU, you would do much better just looping in a 10900K and your GPU block of choice on dual 360s and call it a day. But frankly, for both gaming and productivity usage at this level, seriously, just go with the 5900X and save yourself the cash and the hassle. The claim that this is for gamers, content creators, and overclockers is a bit optimistic, given that gaming isn't strictly about single-threaded performance anymore, and we're hitting GPU limits more often than not and content creators are definitely leveraging all cores, right? So at the MSRP of $350, this unit is not cheap either. It's loud, consumes a lot of power, and your gains are, at the end of the day, heavily silicon lottery dependent. I do at least have to give Intel credit for trying. They're stuck on 14 nanometers, and they're clearly thinking out of the box here. I do think that this design will have more promise if the Peltier unit could be housed externally on its own heatsink venting off its heat. That way you could actually use this for some serious overclocking on all cores. And though this mini fridge 
won't make Frozen Lake out of Comet Lake. Seeing the CPU at zero degrees on an AIO at least made me giggle. And maybe that's worth something after all. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this review. Please give a like if you did and consider subscribing as I continue exploring this case. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon.